or I'm sorry, 296. 296, follow on. 296, we'll stand on the last for a word of prayer. Down in the valley with my Like rain, but I'm I'm good for now. I can I can pass on some rain. Let's get some sunshine, and uh, we keep getting sunshine, and then rain wants to come right back. And I'm I'm learning what the spring is like around here. My mom came in town for a few weeks, and she likes to uh, take tables that she gets for free, and then redo them, and you know sand them down, and paint them or stain them. And so she was helping us do a table of ours, and so she kept taking the tables outside and the chairs to sand them down or to paint them, and just rain stop, rain stop. She's like, I cannot figure out the weather here. It tells my tells me on my phone it's not raining, then it is raining, then it says it's not raining, then it is. And she's just like, this weather's confusing. I'm like, well, this is the most rain it's had we've had since I've lived here. <laughs> and I say, wouldn't expect in the spring, but apparently that's how it's like around here. And uh, so I think we won't be in a drought at least for a little while. Uh, let's pray. Be in prayer for Pastor. He's not able to be here tonight, uh, having some uh, some symptoms from, he thinks, from the shot that he was given to try to get his uh, white blood count up, having some headaches and uh, just uh, some fatigue. So let's pray for him, pray for strength, and that he can be here on Sunday. And uh, Lord willing, he can be here and preach to us and be around. And uh, just pray for him to be able to get it up so he can... Uh, come talk to us, right? And so he can come and fellowship with us. And I know that eats away at him, that he doesn't get to come and be around you. He's got to stay up here and stay away from people and isolate. And I just pray for him and continually, and uh, let's be there for our pastor. Let's open up the service in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we just thank you so much for our church. Lord, I thank you so much for the fellowship that our church has with one another and the love that we have for each other and praying for one another. Lord, we want to lift up our pastor in prayer. And uh, Lord, he's been going through a battle for quite a while now with his, uh, his health and this cancer, Lord. And I pray that you would just help him with his white blood count, help it to get up uh, to where the doctors want it to be, Lord. And I pray that uh, the low bl uh, white blood count would be um, a good thing, that, uh, that this, is, this treatment is working, Lord. And I pray that your handiwork would be involved in all this. And I pray you just help him and encourage him and give him strength that he needs to be able to be here in his pulpit on Sunday. Lord, I pray it'd be with others that are sick right now or not doing good. 
pray to be with Miss Lori, and uh, she's struggling right now as well with her foot, and I pray you just help her and help the doctors to know how to help her and for her to recover uh, quickly from that. I uh, pray that we'd have a great service tonight, Lord, uh, be with the preaching and the singing, and uh, may it all bring honor and glory to you in Jesus' name, amen. Men, you may be seated. <clears throat> have an announcement here. Uh, Outdoorsman Camp is June 3rd through the 7th for young men ages 12 to 18. Please sign up uh, before May 5th. The sign up sheet is in the back. Um, information is on the welcome desk. Please see Brother Nathan Walton if you have any questions. And then, attention, Bible Club parents, we will have a Pine Car Derby workshop this Saturday, April 13th from 1 to 3 p.m. We will have tools available if your child needs help cutting out their car with a saw. Any questions, see Brother Nathan Walton. That'll be a lot of fun. And so that this Saturday, if you'd like to come to it, you're not required to, but if you want to come and need some help uh, with uh, how to do some things, we'll have some people there that can help with that and different tools and whatnot. Uh, we've had, I believe last night I counted, we had, uh, I was telling Brother Roger, we've had 18 people let us know their balloons, uh, they have found a balloon uh, so far, and uh, pretty neat, and I know some more came in this week that Pastor will announce on Sunday, and it's uh, so pretty neat that we are getting these people to respond back, but then we'll be able to get to respond back to them with some information about the gospel and how they can know for sure they're going to heaven when they die. We have it on the webpage when they go there to that QR code, there's information right there about heaven when they come to the page. It's not just about the balloon, but they'll get to, you know, if they want to watch a video about salvation, they can. And so pray the Lord uses those balloons and we can see somebody saved. And honestly, there's probably a lot of people that, uh, those of you that have been a part of Blessed Hope doing this for many, many years, when you get to heaven someday, we'll find out the impact that it had on people out there. And it's pretty neat, just a few that I've read, how one lady said her husband passed away and uh, I think the couple days before that, and she found it on their property, and it just brought joy to her face when she found it and was able to let, uh, uh, let us know about it. And so she said, thank you for doing what you're doing. And uh, so it's encouraging to people out there, and some people may get saved uh, by going to the website or being able to uh, get things in the mail from us um, about heaven. So just be in prayer for those. And uh, don't forget to be prepared for this coming Sunday. I forgot the name of it. I know it's hot. Uh, fired, up. fired up. How could I forget? I just have hot Cheetos in my mind, hot Cheetos in my mind. <clears throat> fired Up Sunday. Now, does anybody know the song Fired Up, Fired Up, Christian Fired Up? Anybody know it? Oh, my goodness. I wish I'd teach it to everybody. We used to sing this song called Fire Up, Fire Up, Christian Fire Up. Keep the fire burning in your soul. Fire Up, Fire Up, Fire Up, Christian Fire Up. Keep the fire burning in your soul. Fire Up. We get the kids going crazy with that, so... Maybe that's one we need to sing. It's really hard. There's a lot of lyrics to it, so it might be tricky <laughs> for learning it. But that's all the announcement. Uh, that's why he doesn't get to write the songbook now. <laughs> uh, bus songs, amen. 405, Banner of the Cross. 405. Sing this like you're fired up. 405.
One, 401, set my soul to fire. Think about the words and ushers come on the last verse there. 401, set my soul to fire.
your Bibles tonight, let's go to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. Let's all stand together for reading of God's Word. <coughs> Matthew chapter number 5. <clears throat> let's begin reading in verse number 13. It says, Ye are the salts of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you just guide my words tonight, my thoughts, and just help me to uh, preach what you want me to preach tonight, Lord. I know that it will be a help to me as I was studying through this, Lord, and this passage of Scripture, Lord. And I pray that it would be a strength and a help to those that are here tonight. And I pray you bless the rest of our service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When Jesus tells us that we are to be the light of the world, that certainly makes sense. I mean, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Jesus came to the world, this world which was full of sin and darkness and said, I am the light. John said, that is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So when Jesus told his disciples that, and when he tells us that in his word that we are to be the light, it makes sense. Light in a dark world. Did you know that Darkness cannot put out light. Pretty simple concept. Isn't it amazing that you could have more darkness than light, but you'll always be able to see the light. Just a little light is all it takes to be able to be seen. You may be the only person in your family that is saved, but you're a light. You may be the only person at your workplace or in your school or in your neighborhood that is saved, but let your light shine. You may be the only person that you can think of in your family that really serves the Lord with your life. But I'm going to tell you, you can make an impact. Your light can shine. When there's more darkness, your light shines bright. Uh, we understand that when Jesus said, let your light shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He said for us to be light, but before he said for us to be light, he said we are to be the salt of the earth. Well, let's think about salt for a minute. How many of you like salt, by the way? Some people, how many of you really like salt? All right. Brother Nathan came to our house and I mean, he just, for what seemed like 10 minutes, just put, I was like, do we have any salt left after that? He likes salt. I mean, I love salt. Some people apparently love it more than I do. And, uh, but man, I think all food, I think it's Miss Kelsey, my sister-in-law, Kelsey, she just does never put salt on anything, doesn't ever think to put it on it. Man, the second food gets put in my mouth and if it doesn't have salt, my first thought is it needs what? Salt. It needs salt. But salt, salt in its physical form is something we put on food to make it taste better. I've eaten a lot of things as long as there was salt. One thing I did not eat that didn't have salt was when we went to the Philippines, I was about 14, 15 years old, uh, the missionary there in the Philippines told us all, he said, you all have to try balut. I said, balut? What is balut? And so they showed us some pictures of what balut is. And balut is an egg that has a little chick in there. And you crack the top of it and you drink the juice out of there. Then you peel it all the way open and you swallow or chew the chick however you want to do it. And then there is the yolk, and you eat the yolk, and the yolk tastes, I mean, it's literally like rubber. I mean, it is, you're just chomping forever because it is terrible. Some of you look like you're ready to try it tonight. <laughs> so the missionaries told us we had to eat this, and we said, no, we're not eating that. We were just like, no, we're not eating that. And they said, it's really disrespectful to the people here if you don't eat their food. And that's a very cultural thing in the Philippines, but it's what we're known for here. And I mean, we were just like, you got to be kidding me. And they said, just do it for them. They, they're going to want to know if you ate it. And so we'll get you some. And it's not as bad as you think. And so they got it for us. 
I've never been scared in my life to eat something. And I was scared to death. And I, as a teenager, my dad kind of taught me just to eat everything. And I thought I had the appetite to eat everything until it came to that. And my dad went first and got through it. And they told us, swallow it. Don't chew it. Just swallow the chick. And so sure enough, my dad did it. I got through it. And then my brother, who doesn't have the appetite like I have, or my dad, starts chewing on it. He couldn't get himself to swallow it, so he chewed on it to make it better. <laughs> crunch, crunch. <laughs> just terrible. I mean, they had trash cans next to us, and I don't know how we didn't throw up. But somehow we got through it. And then we got done. And they said, wait, did we not put any seasoning on it? Did we not put the salt on it? And I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, usually you put seasoning and salt on it, and it makes it taste way better. And I said, well, that would have been nice. I would have drowned it in salt if I could have. Like, oh, my goodness. And they said, yeah, it tastes way better. And they said, you want to try it again? I said, no, I don't care if salt <laughs> makes it taste better. But salt makes food tastes better. It's a season. You know, the Lord would have us make us to believe that uh, God and the Bible, it's our job to make people f think that it tastes good. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. The Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We are to be salt today. We live in a country tonight that's the fastest growing religion, if you call it, in, in the world is atheism, the religion with no God. The world, for the most part, has lost its desire for God. They have lost their appetite for God. The truth has fallen in the streets. I mean, you turn on the news today. If you would have told you 10 years ago America would be where it's at today, you would have never guessed. It's amazing. Those of you that have lived longer than I have, it's amazing. Just in the last six, seven, eight years, the changes of wickedness in America that have happened in a short amount of time. It's, it's incredible. It didn't just happen overnight, though. There was gradual changes. I personally believe that the church is responsible for it because you look back at churches in the 1900s. They may have had some different doctrinal beliefs, but morally they stood for the same things. You could go into a church and feel like you were in a church. You might have been taught something different, but you could go into church and it looked like a church and it felt like a church. Today you go into a church and you can't tell if you're in a rock concert or if you're in a church where you're at. Nobody looks like a Christian. Nobody acts or talks like a Christian. As the world has gotten worse, our churches have gotten worse with it. I've heard the statement you know, say, well, if, it's, you know, if, if the world's doing that, then the church shouldn't do that. Now, that's not the way, that's not the standard we should set for ourselves. Because what the world did 20 years ago was still wrong. Just because they have moved the line and they're way over here doesn't mean, well, okay, well, now we can move the line with them. God drew the line in Scripture. God gave us a Bible to abide by. We don't look at the world and kind of gauge where they're at and say, okay, we need to stay away from them, but let's just keep a little bit of a distance and let's just gradually move wherever they're at. We'll just stay this far apart. The, the wor as, as the world is getting worse, there should be a bigger difference between Christianity and those who serve the Lord than this world. But the problem is, is that's not happening. The problem is churches today, not saying that a blessed hope, but churches of today are changing as the world is changing. And there's no clear distinction between right and wrong. Soul also creates thirst. How many of you played sports outside maybe or even inside where you did long days of practices and they ever gave you salt uh, tablets before? Anybody ever had that before? OK, I've had it before. Why do they give you the salt to create what? Thirst, to create thirst. They want you to drink water. And as a kid and as a teenager, sometimes you lack the mindset of drinking enough water. And that's a lot of times people dehydrate all the time. And they want you to be thirsty. So they give you those salt tablets to create a thirst. Salt creates that thirst. May I ask you this question tonight? Does your life create thirst for God in anyone else? Does your life, when people are around you, when your children are around you, does your life in your children's eyes create a thirst for them to want to serve the Lord more? Do they see things in your life that make them want to get closer to the Lord, to follow your example? Do people in the church look at you 
and you create a thirst and they watch your life and your, your life is creating a thirst in their life to want to serve the Lord. Gandhi once said, I would be a Christian if it wasn't for Christians. I'm impressed with your Christ, but I'm unimpressed with those of you that call yourself Christ. Does your life create thirst? But you know, salt also stings a wound. How many, anybody ever had that before? Got salt on a wound before? It stings. You know, sometimes we say, I'm going to rub a little salt into that wound. It's usually be, we're trying to get back at somebody when we say that, right? It's usually not a good expression. In the Bible, and by the way, the Bible condemns that, right? right? But salt rubs, it gives a sting. Now, uh, salt is a cleansing agent when it's in a wound, but it doesn't feel good. It stings. It hurts. I wonder, does our life and the way that we live cause any conviction to those who are living contrary to the Bible? How many have ever been a part of a conversation with worldly people or people that are backslidden or people that really aren't quite serving the Lord like they should be with their life and they mentioned something and felt uncomfortable saying it around you? Raise your hand if that's ever happened before. Okay, that was a good thing. <laughs> that was a good thing. When the world or people that are trying to act like the world feel comfortable, this is one thing I always strive to instill into teenagers, is that nobody should ever be comfortable doing worldly things around you. If they are, then something's wrong with your life. You need to examine yourself because if they are comfortable doing it around you, it's because they look at your life and think, his life looks like he'd be okay with this. Her life looks like it would be okay with this. The way they talk. Are they okay with saying certain words around you because they know you're the type of Christian or person that won't ever say anything, won't ever make sure that people do the right thing around them? I believe that salt can be used in many different ways, but I believe the primary reason for God calling a salt in this text is the reason for salt in Jesus' day. Salt's primary purpose in those days was a preservative. Uh, they didn't have refrigerators like we do. Praise the Lord for refrigerators. Amen. But they didn't have those, and so they would place the meat in salt and thus preserve the meat for a long period of time. So I believe that our job as Christians is to preserve truth. I believe it's our job to preserve the truth that God's been given to you. It's our job to pass it down to the next generation. A phrase I always like to say, if it was good when it was given to me, then it's still good to pass it on. I don't need to change it. I don't need to change anything. The heritage that's been given to me, it's still good to keep going on to the next generation. The problem with our society, though, is that there's a new way. Because society and culture and everything's changed, then Christianity, Christianity and churches think we need to change along with it. God's way is timeless. It's, not, it's, it's endless. His ways are always going to be truth. His principles are always going to be truth. It doesn't matter what the world does. We can follow God's principles and God's truth and stand by them and then pass them down, preserve them for the next generation. I wonder if somebody was to walk into our church and try to take away our Bibles or they passed a law in America that we were no longer allowed to own Bibles anymore and they came and confiscated them all from us. I wonder how much you personally could preserve in your life, up to this point, how much of it could you preserve to pass on to your children? How much of it do you have memorized? How much of it have you studied to pass on to the next generation? Chemistry, how many of you like chemistry? Anybody like chemistry? Wow, both of you, unbelievable. Did you take chemistry this year, right? And your hand wasn't up, huh? <laughs> Chemistry, I, I, he asked me to help him quiz him on a test. I never did. I took a little bit of chemistry for fun. I didn't have to take it, but I was taking a little bit, and I said, yeah, never mind. I don't want to do this. But I was, I was helping him. He asked me to quiz him on a test. I said, man, I can hardly even read this stuff. You want me to help you quiz you on this? Chemistry, though, teaches us about elements that we use all the time. Water is H2O, and salt has two elements. Salt is sodium chloride. That's all it is. They say, science tells us that you can do whatever you want with salt. You can boil it. You can freeze it. You can crush it. You can put salt anywhere you want, but it'll always be sodium chloride. It'll never change. Aren't you glad that as a Christian, no matter what you do, nothing can ever take you away from the Father? Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful? Because we're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. But I'm glad 
that we can always come before the Father and He can forgive us. You may go through some tough times, some difficult times in your life, or you may even backslide as a Christian, but you will always be a Christian. You will always be sodium chloride. The Bible said, uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He also said in John chapter 10, verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. Aren't you glad that's the truth today? There's religions that don't preach that. There's religions that believe you need to go and confess your sins to a man. But I'm glad that the God that we serve and the Bible that we read has the truth in it that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And when we mess up, we can run back to the Father. We can get things right with Him. Um, if you're 90% sure tonight that you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, you're 100% lost. I hope tonight that you don't leave here today without knowing you're 100% for sure you're going to heaven when you die. God's called us to be the salt of the earth. We need to have him as our Savior. The Bible says, Because these things are written unto him that believeth in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have everlasting life. Man, I'm so glad I don't have to doubt my salvation. I'm so glad that I don't have to wonder or guess or think, I, I think I'm going to heaven. I can know that I have everlasting life. So you and me, we are sodium chloride, and nothing can ever change that. But Jesus said in this verse, if the salt has lost its savor. Well, if salt can never be anything other than sodium chloride, how can it lose its savor? Well, how many of you have ever went to get the salt shaker or some of your salt and it was all clumped up into a ball and you're trying to get it out of the salt shaker? Have you ever had that happen before? Something happened to it. Well, it, something happened to where it wouldn't come out of any of the holes anymore. It had lost its savor. Well, the only way that can happen is if it was contaminated. It was contaminated. It lost its savor. Have you ever had salt before that just wasn't good salt? Didn't taste good. Didn't, ha didn't create the satisfaction that you wanted from that. Maybe you have tasted it and, and you thought to yourself, you know, what's wrong with it? Well, there was something wrong with it and it had been contaminated. In your life, you're supposed to be the salt of the earth. That's supposed, the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But there are times in our life when the salt loses its savor. There were times maybe in your life where you were on a spiritual high serving the Lord and the salt had all of its flavor. But then there were times where you were going through it and you were struggling with some things in your life and the salt had lost its savor. If you're here tonight, I hope and pray that your life is a life that exemplifies salt that has flavor. But I know in a room this size that that's not true of everybody that's here. And I also know that if you have a life that has salt, that has flavor right now, you will go through a time where it will be tested. You will go through times where you don't, you're not happy like you once were. You're struggling with something. God will put you through some things. And I believe tonight that there's Many things that can contaminate the salt in our life. But I want to look at three things tonight. Number one, the contaminant of sin. That's a pretty broad statement. But Jesus said that all unrighteousness is sin. I think we are having trouble today figuring out what's right and what's wrong. The world today is making everything that seems wrong in a Christian's eyes all of a sudden right. But then we have Christians today that were passed down a godly heritage to them of what was right and wrong. And because the world has changed, because society has changed, because culture has changed, we've advanced. These things, you know, aren't quite as wrong anymore. And my mom and dad and my grandparents too, took too strong of a stand on this. And we don't need to take that strong of a stand. And we're changing all the time. I've heard it said, I'm sure I remember exactly the phrase, but basically where the line is at for you in your life as a parent most likely that'll be the middle for your kids. And then when they pass it on, the line will constantly keep getting moved. Where are you drawing the line in Christianity with things? There's a lot of issues out there that the, the church today 
wants to overlook. There's nothing wrong with anything now. We can look like the world. We can talk like the world. We can sing like the world. As long as Christian music just has good words to it, nothing else matters. The tunes and and the instruments and everything we use can sound exactly like the world, but it doesn't matter. I'm sure that's exactly what God wanted when he created music, for it to sound like the devil's music, but just have God's words in it. Just combine them together. Because Jesus and Satan always work together all throughout Scripture. We see that principle after principle. But somehow, when it comes to music, we think that is okay. It's a touchy touchy subject. 1 John 5, 17 says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Let's think about that for a little bit. How do we define righteousness? Well, we don't have to look very far to define righteousness. God, Jesus, they are righteous. Amen? He is righteous. You find righteousness in God because He is righteous. He is holy. He is pure. He is without sin. He is righteous. I'm going to ask you tonight, how about your words? What you talk about, what you say, the words that you use, are they righteous? Are they words that Jesus would use? I hear Christians all the time say the phrase, oh, my God, as if that's a good thing. That's an okay thing to say. Would Jesus walk in here and say that? Is that something he would say? Take his father's name in vain? Here's the sad part about it. Is a lot of Christians will use what they, Christian cuss words you can call them. And they'll use words that aren't quite the world's words, but they'll use them thinking they're okay without ever looking up the definition. Some of you might need to check your vocabulary. You'll be surprised at some of the words that a lot of Christians use that are just euphemisms for the worldly words that we know we should never say. Look them up. Question yourself. Make sure you have a godly talk, the way you communicate. Think about those words that you say when you're upset or frustrated, and those, that word, those words that come out of your mouth. mouth. Ask yourself, is this, is this something that Jesus would say? Right. Ask yourself that. You don't even need the Bible to go check. You can use your dictionary to go find out if you're going to, be, can get, to get convicted. How about your actions? Are the reactions that God would have? The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. Psalm 68, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We've been here a, a decent while tonight. Uh, we've had time of praying. You see, there would be no reason, no sense in praying if our salt had been contaminated with sin. The Bible says, behold, in Isaiah 59, 1, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Your life is, if you want God to answer your prayers, the way you're living your life is going to matter whether or not God's listening to your prayers or not. Sin is something we're all going to deal with. That's just a part of life. That's the way God made us. But you see, when we do something wrong we shouldn't do, We're required to go before the Lord and get that right with him. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God's repair shop is open tonight. If you've got something that you need to get forgiveness, you need to get right with the Lord or something that you've been doing, maybe only you know about it's a secret sin. Get it right with the Lord because you're blocking God from hearing your prayers, from answering your prayers tonight. The Bible says in Malachi 7, 18, God delights in mercy. I don't know about you, but when someone does me wrong, I don't delight in mercy. (laughs) That's my human nature, and I know it's your human nature too, because we're all alike and we're all sinners. But for some reason, God delights in mercy. When we do wrong, God loves it when we come to him and we confess our sins and say, God, I'm I'm sorry. I I know I shouldn't have done that. I know it's wrong. Please forgive me of my sin. I want to move forward in my life. I want to get it right with you, Lord. Sin contaminates our soul. God just wants to... Show mercy towards each and every one of us when we do something we shouldn't do. How about secondly tonight, the contaminant of self. We have the contam- uh, sin contaminates it. How about self? Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you know that the, the I is the middle letter of Lucifer? Lucifer was a powerful angel in heaven. He was one of the three most powerful 
uh, angels, and according to Exodus, uh, or Ezekiel, he was the angel in charge of worship in heaven. He was the one who was created as a being to know how to honor and glorify God, and he led in worship. Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend from the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You see, Lucifer had an eye problem. He had an eye problem. Do you also know the middle letter of pride is I? And pride is sin. Yep. Right. Yes, Middle letter of sin is what? I. I. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. The Bible says, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look. Sometimes we need to get out of the way. Sometimes God uses us to accomplish things for him. And we look at ourselves and we glorify in ourselves. We pump ourselves up. We feel good about what we did. And God doesn't like that. God's not happy when we take all the credit. God's not happy when we don't honor and glorify him and give him all the glory. God wants us to worship him. God wants us when he uses us to point towards him, point others towards him. God's going to use you in your life. He's going to do things with you. He's going to give you a Sunday school class. He's going to put you in opportunities to be used to do great things for him. But uh, Sometimes, unfortunately, we allow ourselves to get in the way. Sometimes we allow ourselves to get in the way of God honoring us and God doing things for us in our life. Uh, D.L. Moody once said, the one I fear the most is the one who walks underneath this hat. When Abraham Lincoln was running for president, they asked him on the campaign trail, they said, are you, are you scared of anyone? And he said, yes, I am. And they were surprised by his answer because he was seemed like he was dominating everybody. And he was out in front of everyone, leading in all the polls. And they said, well, which one is it? He said, a man named Lincoln. He said, if I'm going to be defeated, I'll be defeated by Lincoln. That's a wise, wise statement. Sometimes you got to get out of the way. Sometimes you got to examine yourself and say, what am I doing that's causing God to not help me in my life? How am I losing my Savior? What's contaminating my Savior tonight? When God points to the signs of the time, he doesn't point to drunkenness, and he doesn't point to homosexuality. He doesn't point to the gangs in the street. He doesn't point to falling stock prices. He says the problem is you're worshiping the creature instead of worshiping the creator. Tonight, I needs to die. I needs to die. Get yourself out of the way. Paul tells us that we are to be a living Sacrifice. I, I, when you read through that, I imagine that the Roman church, when they heard, heard him say that, they thought he was crazy and thought, what in the world is Paul talking about? Did he not take his medication? I, I, because up to that point, every sacrifice that they had when they would pr- uh, present a lamb or, or a goat as an offering, they would kill it. And he's telling them to have a living sacrifice If you brought a lamb or a goat, it had to die. But he's telling them something that went completely against their culture, completely against what they've done their whole lives. And Paul's saying, I want you to be a living sacrifice. They must have thought, what in the world? But that's exactly what he wanted. That's exactly what God wanted. He doesn't want us to die physically. He wants us to give our life to him and live for him. But the problem with a living sacrifice that it always wants to crawl off the altar that's why Paul said, I die what? What do you say? I die what? Daily. I die daily. It's a daily thing. It's not a one-time thing. You see, the bullock, when they would kill it, it wasn't going anywhere. No. Once they killed it, it wasn't going anywhere. But the problem is, we come to church, we come to the altar, we'll make a decision, we'll get convicted, or we'll go to a conference somewhere, we'll hear some preaching. Boy, we'll make a decision, but tomorrow morning our flesh gets in the way. Tomorrow morning, our flesh tries to get us to get rid of that decision, to try to give us a different mindset, to give us a different viewpoint on it, and to backtrack upon that decision. Paul said, I must die daily. Every morning, we need to have a funeral for ourselves. By the way, I is the middle letter in the word revival, too. It's the middle word in the word revival. 
If we will die to this old nature, God can do something with us. We can actually have revival. During the Welsh revivals, uh, a London newspaper sent a reporter over there uh, to Wales and wanted to get some information about what was going on over there. So they sent this reporter over there. And when he got over there, he didn't know where, where these revivals were being hurt, uh, held. And he was just, well, where are these preachers? Where are they preaching at? He started to wonder and just could not figure out where it was at. And he saw a policeman over uh, standing in the street. And he walks over to this policeman. And he says, he said, hey, do you know where these Welsh revivals are being held at? And the police officer broadened his shoulder and said, yes, I do. He said, well, can you, can you tell me where it's taking place? He said, yes, I can. It's taking place right underneath this outfit right here that you see. And that, or he said, under this uniform. <laughs> under this uniform, it's taking revival right here. We can have revival right here underneath this uniform. We can have revival in our personal life when we'll get ourselves out of the way. Sin will contaminate salt. Self will contaminate it. How about Lastly tonight, scars, the contaminant of scars. The Christian life is a battle. It's not easy. We're in warfare, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Boy, we're seeing that prevalent right now. We'll look at the news and things going on. Boy, those things, of the rulers of darkness... Spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6 that we are to put on the whole armor of God. Well, why would you put on the armor if you're not in war? We are in war. Put on the whole armor of God. There's no reason to put it on if we're not in war. He said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. 2 Timothy 2, 4. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We are soldiers in the army of Jesus Christ. We're in a battle. We're in a warfare. And when you're in battle, sometimes you get injured. Someone's going to say something that's going to hurt your feelings. Someone's going to do something that's going to hurt you. You know, they, uh, what's the phrase? Uh, the sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, that's a lie. <laughs> when your kids come home from school or from church and stuff, it's usually the words that someone said that they're upset about. When you're talking to your spouse at home and you're upset about something, someone said something to you at work. Someone said something to you at church. Your words are powerful. In this life, we're going to get hurt some way or another. We're going to have things happen to us. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. This is Jesus talking. If you were of the world, the world would love his own but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. You see, the world hates us as Christians. <clears throat> when you stand up for the Lord, you're putting a target upon yourself. The more decisions you make for the Lord, you're putting a target upon yourself. When you're, when you're sitting on the sidelines, Satan's not worried about you. You don't get involved in ministries and you don't get involved in Sunday school. You don't come to church very often or you're not working on a bus route, not working in the Sunday school class. You're just kind of... Sitting on the sidelines, Satan's not too worried about you because you're not making much of a difference for the Lord. Right. But those that are involved, those that are out souling, those that are reaching people, helping people get to know how they can know for sure they're going to heaven when they die, those are the people that Satan says, I, 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 I got to stop them. I've got to find a way to trip them up. I've got to find a way to discourage them. When those opportunities present themselves to you, I look at them as reminders. I must be doing something right. I must be doing something right because Satan sent this person or Satan sent this to happen in my life because he is discouraged in what I'm doing. He's not happy with what I'm doing in my life. <clears throat> I think about different men in the Bible. How about Joseph in the Bible who was mistreated? Out of all of his brothers, he was hated amongst all of them. Joseph is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Pastor just preached on him on Sunday. I just love the story of Joseph. I can't, I can't read it enough. Because it just, and the comparisons between him and Jesus is incredible as well in their life. Have you ever looked at it before? But Joseph was hated by his brothers. They wanted to kill him, but Reuben stepped in. Remember that? Reuben stepped in and, and saved his life, but then they sold him into slavery. I mean, I guess that's better. <laughs> Getting sold into slavery. He gets sold into slavery and he goes there and he tries to stand up for the Lord and tries to do right. 
And then when, when temptation presents itself to him, he does the right thing and still makes the right decision. And we praise him for that. But he doesn't get honored for that decision in his life. He didn't get honored at that time. He gets put in prison for three years and forgotten about. Three years. I mean, he got built up to the second highest in the land and then overnight thrown into prison, underground, just like that. But at the end of the story, you see Joseph and he says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Man, I hope I have that spirit. I hope I have that mindset. If I get tested with anything, half is what Joseph ever went through in his life. A quarter of what Joseph went through. How about Paul? Paul's preaching in Philippi, and he's faithfully serving the Lord, and they don't like it. And they throw him in prison. So he decides to sing. Music is powerful, isn't it? And it wasn't one of those types of things where he was, you know, their father think of his food and just, amen. Don't anybody hear that? No, they sang to where the whole prison heard them. Everybody heard them. And suddenly an earthquake came and all the doors of all the prisoners were open. All their shackles were loosened. And they were free to go. And the prison guard was so fearful because they were all loose. I mean, he basically didn't do his job. And was going to get killed. And he's about to kill himself. And uh, Paul says, Paul tells him, no, 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 don't, don't. And he, and he tries to stop him. And he tells him, we're all still here. And he says, what must I do to be saved? God uses that. And in, in because of the testimony that they had of singing through a tough time, through a trial. After what, if, if I'm Paul and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and then I get thrown in prison, my flesh wants to have that reaction of, God, what's going on? I'm doing what you told me to do, and this is what I get treated with? That's what our flesh wants to say. That's the reaction that our flesh wants to have, but that's not Paul's reaction. Paul glorified in his infirmities, and he sang unto the Lord, and because of his testimony, God used him in Silas to, to, uh, to cause that trial, that hard thing in their life, to not become a scar. You see, if we don't take care of those things in our life, they can turn into scars in our life. If you're saved and you have lost the Savior of your soul because of sin, because of scars, or because of self, or whatever it is that the Holy Spirit has laid upon your heart and on your mind tonight, I beg you to get alone with the Lord. Get alone with Him and ask Him, Lord, what is it that's causing me to not have Savior in my soul tonight? Please help me to get that contamination out of my life. Ask God to help you get it out. I know he can. I know he will help you. It's just a matter of whether or not you as a Christian will humble yourself. Right. Right now, you know the sins that you're dealing with more than any other person in this room. More than your spouse. We know personally what it is. But he knows as well. The salt has lost its savor. Let's not be those Christians that we used to do this. I, I'm, I, my dad calls them used to be Christians. Used to be Christians. No, let's have the salt that has the flavor. The salt that's going to make a difference in this world. The salt that Jesus intended us to be. Let's be that salt tonight. The salt of the earth. Let's pray to our Father, Lord. Thank you so much for truths, principles, guidance, wisdom that you've given us all throughout Scripture, Lord. I don't know why you want to use us, but for some reason you have chosen us as sinners to be used of you to make a difference in this world. And day by day, Lord, there's less and less people standing up for right. Elijah thought in his day that he was the only one left standing up, the only one doing right. Boy, he just wanted to go, back, go to heaven, but God said, no, I had all these other people that are doing, serving me, that are making a difference. Sometimes as Christians, we can be discouraged thinking we're the only few left serving the Lord. We're the only few that are standing up for right. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't have that mindset. I pray that we'd realize you've got people all over the world that are still serving you. People all over the world that are making a difference. We need to be encouraged in you and get close to you. Just because the world's going to hell in a handbasket doesn't mean we just say, well, I might as well just give up. I'm, gonna give, I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm going to please my flesh. I'm going to do whatever my flesh wants to do. I'm going to have as much fun as I possibly can before I have to go. I pray that wouldn't be our mindset. I pray that we would have to decide 
to be the type of Christians that will bring, like my grandma said, bring as many with us to heaven as we can before we leave this earth. As the piano begins to play...